What's up, Well That's Good fam? Welcome back to the Well That's Good podcast, y'all. I am so excited for today's episode. We have a very special guest. I'm actually kind of nervous. I'm so excited. But before I get to that, I got to remind y'all one more time that the Ello Sister Conference is August 19th and 20th. And you know what? I lied. This will not be the last time I remind you because we want all of you to be there. You can go to ellosisterconference.com. Get your tickets today. Like I said, it's August 19th and 20th right here in my hometown, Monroe, Louisiana. Cannot wait to meet you guys and see you guys there. So go check that out while you have an opportunity to. And now, without further ado, we can get to who is on the podcast today. He is very well known with his YouTube channel having more than 90 million hits. We actually have Emmanuel Acho on the podcast today. He has done some incredible things, to name a few. He started the podcast, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, which, like I said, has reached to over 90 million views. And he's also just helped so many people around our country with racial reconciliation, which I just got to say, I am so, so thankful for this man and what he has done. He also is a 2021 Sports Emmy winner. He's a Fox Sports analyst and a television personality. You might have seen him because he helped host The Bachelor one season. All my girls out there said, hey, y'all, he is an incredible person and I cannot wait to interview him on the podcast. So without further ado, welcome to the podcast, Emmanuel Acho. Yo, Sadie, it is an honor. For those listening, Sadie and I have been social media friends for like 18 months now. Um, we have. But it's not official until it's official. So it's glad to officially be your friend. The Bachelor was um, the job of a lifetime. Uh, unknown fact that people do not realize that was a six hour shoot that was cut down to 44 minutes. No six way. Hours. What? It is, um, the hardest thing I've ever done on television, truly. And for those that don't wow. know, I host a, a daily show. So that's not like uh, saying it lightly. Um, Sadie, the directions were truly to some degree as such. Okay, Emmanuel, walk out, walk onto the stage, walk onto the stage, and you look directly at camera and you read from the teleprompter. Welcome, I'm your host, Emmanuel Acho, taking over for Chris Harrison, which means this is likely going to be the most uncomfortable episode of The <laughs> Bachelor yet. Pivot to camera two, Sadie. Now, continuing reading from the second camera on this episode, we will reveal who Matt James finally falls in love with. Is it Rachel Kirkconnell? Is it Michelle? Is it Brie? <laughs> After reading 360 Pivot, open up and bring out the first guest, Brie. Bring her out. If she goes in for a hug, hug her. If she doesn't, don't sit on the couches, look directly at Brie, talk for a minute and a half. But Emmanuel, after a minute and a half, you have to toss to a three minute video package <laughs> that Brie has not yet seen. Oh my gosh. Talk- when you toss to that package that Brie has yet to see, if you see her start to get emotional, just simply ask her one short question. So, Brie, how are you feeling right now? <laughs> um, so I, I just wanted to give your listeners, your 18 to 30 and 30 plus year old listeners, a little bit of the behind the scenes of how that all went. Oh my gosh, I, I'm sure everyone just loved that. It's almost like we could have expected it to go like that, especially if you watch The Bachelor and you know that question. Like, how does that make you feel? I mean, and you see them crying, you're like, "What? Well, how do you think it made them feel? You know, you're <laughs> showing them the love of their life and whatever. Um, so I know you've had a lot of uncomfortable conversations. That's your whole thing, uncomfortable conversations with a black man, which, by the way, I mean, I said this before, but just thank you. Like, thank you for what you have done over the past few years um, from someone who really was trying to seek wisdom and learn. I watched so many of your videos and learned a lot. And that's why I followed you on social media. And when you followed me back, I was like, this is awesome. I knew we'd be friends. Um, But truly, just thank you for that. And I can only imagine that a lot of uncomfortable conversations led you to be able to own that moment of The Bachelor very well. Um, so just want to take a second to say thank you for what you do. And to everyone listening, if you don't follow this man, you need to. You'll learn a lot. But before we really dive into the podcast, I got to ask you the question I ask everyone who comes on the Whoa, That's Good podcast. And the question is, and I'm really looking forward to this because you spit out a lot of advice. But what's the best piece of advice that you've ever been given? <laughs> so that's such a tough question because I live by quotes. Um, mm-hmm. The best piece of advice I've ever been given. Uh, okay, I'll give you two answers. I'll give you two answers. Um, uh, the, the reason I have to give two answers is because you can speak in Christianese, but also you can speak practically. 
right? Yep, Christianese yep. being like a super spiritual answer. But then I just got to give like a real practical answer. Um, the, the best advice from a spiritual perspective is um, get to know Jesus. He's worth getting to know. Hmm. The best, like the best advice anybody could be given is get to know Jesus. He is worth getting to know. My brother tells a story of um, his, my brother played for the Arizona Cardinals for four years, played in the national football league for 10. And his, his, his close mentor was like an 80 year old man who was his next door neighbor. And he was on his deathbed, Sadie, my brother's mentor for four years in Arizona while my brother was in his early twenties was on his deathbed. And my brother was like, do you have just any final wisdom that you could impart on me? And my brother's mentor told him, get to know Jesus. Hmm. And the second thing my brother's mentor told him was, you're worth getting to know. And I just, I love how powerful that is of like, Sadie, you are worth getting to know or Emmanuel, you are worth getting to know or listener, you are worth getting to know. That's just so powerful. Hmm. Um, the next more practical piece of advice that I have been given, um, I would probably say, be you because everybody else is taken. Yep. And I think yep. we live in a world now, Sadie, where everybody is trying to be like somebody else. Oh, well, I want to be like Sadie. I just love her so much and her family looks so cute on Instagram. <laughs> or like, but I want to be like this person or that person. Man, everybody is already taken. So Be the best version of yourself because everybody else is taken. That's great. I love that. The sign behind me literally says live original. That's my whole ministry of just live original. You were created originally. And whenever you live um, originally and you live to be the person that you were created to be, I find that you don't compare yourself to anyone else because who else is there to compare yourself to, you know? And when you're looking at God and you're like, okay, God, you created me. I'm going to learn who I am from you and not who the world tells me I should be or says I have to be. There's just such a confidence that comes with that. And the world gets to see something that they'd never seen before, a new image of God. And so I love that great advice. And I love your your advice about how you're worth getting to know and how it you can tell, even with you saying that, that that shaped a lot of who you are and what you do, because that's what you do. You tell people they're worth getting to know and you yeah. show that by your interviews. So I want to ask you, so you already opened up the door that, you know, you believe in Jesus, you love Jesus, you have faith. Do you feel like your relationship with God has shaped what you've done? You know, has that helped you with lean into the things that you're doing right now? Yes. Yeah, so as Sadie has kind of alluded to uncomfortable conversations with a black man, uh, the series I started that uh, partnered me with Oprah, amongst other things. All I'm really doing is preaching. It's just that people who aren't familiar with the church aren't familiar with what I'm saying. So they're that's like, true. oh, my gosh, Emmanuel, that's so good. I'm like. Yeah, Paul said it, you know, yeah, like, yeah. Um, like I said the other day, I was like, um, I was like, comparison is the thief of joy. And somebody was like, wow, Emmanuel, that's great. I was like, yeah, yeah, it's in the Old Testament. Um, so <laughs> say, <That's> my, awesome. <laughs> my faith and my relationship with Jesus has truly dictated my speech because it is Oh, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yes. And so I think that I just try to speak with words that have been impressioned on me. Scared. And if we're being honest, I would say that Jesus was the ultimate unifier. Yeah. And I now try to stand in a position to act as a bridge in the midst of the turmoil between our black brothers and sisters and our white brothers and sisters. I just tried to act as a bridge and a unifier understanding that empathy is the greatest way um, to love. And I always say, and I don't know if you've read a book called Love Does, Bob Goff. Yes, yes. Phenomenal He was just on the podcast too. That's so good. Yeah, Bob Goff is, and it's crazy enough, after I wrote my last book, Bob Goff DM'd me and I was like, wait, you know who I am? (laughs) That's awesome. Uh, um, But I I think about the aspect of, in, in this day and age of society, Guilt doesn't cause anyone to change. Love does. Yep. And I try to speak from a place of love. 
All right, y'all know I like to travel and I have to go a lot of different places for my job. I love it, especially if Christian and Honey get to go with me. However, I do get a little motion sickness. And if I'm looking over my notes or tending to Honey and unable to watch the road or turn around, you know, that's whenever it gets bad. So I know I need to feel my best, but I don't want to take anything because I don't want to feel drowsy or unable to focus. And that is why I love Relief Band. Relief Band is the number one FDA cleared anti-nausea wristband that has been clinically proven to quickly relieve and effectively prevent nausea and vomiting. If you deal with nausea from motion sickness, migraines, morning sickness, chemotherapy, or even anxiety and due sickness, I mean, who hasn't been anxious with the stress over the past two years? Relief Band helps with all of that too. Their product is 100% drug free, so it will not make you sleepy and has zero side effects. Originally designed over 20 years ago for hospital patients, this technology is now available to everyone. So just like it says, you simply put on the band on your wrist and you can even adjust the intensity depending on how you're feeling. How it works is Relief Band simulates a nerve in the wrist that travels to the part of the brain that controls nausea from anxiety or other elements. So it actually blocks that signal to, that your brain is sending to your stomach telling your stomach that you're sick. I love how effective it is and how quickly it works and motion sickness is so much better because of it. So don't let the fear of nausea prevent you from your present life or the important moments of life. Right now, you can join over 100,000 Relief Band users with an exclusive offer just for what's Good listeners. If you go to reliefband.com and use promo code WOE, you'll receive 20% off plus free shipping and a no questions asked 30 day money back guarantee. Remember, it's better to have a relief band and not need it than need it and not have it. So head to relief band, R-E-L-I-E-F-B-A-N-D.com and use promo code WOE for 20% off plus free shipping. Hmm. That's so good. I love that. One of my favorite verses is the verse that you quoted from the heart so the mouth shall speak. And it's such a verse to keep you accountable in what you're putting in your heart, how, how you're living on a daily basis. And whenever I started a podcast and I started preaching and speaking places, doing interviews, that verse was like, oh, I better make sure my heart is healthy because I'm speaking a lot and I want to make sure the words I'm saying are powerful. And when you fill that with scripture and you're able to know the things like comparison is the thief of joy, you're able to know, you know, love your neighbor as your Yourself, you know those things and that begins to come out it shapes the world because that is what the Bible is it's words that are active and alive it's words that bring people's bodies to life and so love that you just said that and also can we just back up just a second because you just so casually threw out this got me partnered with Oprah dot 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 continue on and that story is crazy I've heard you tell this story and some of our listeners might not know this um, because you're sitting here and you start this thing that you didn't even know if it was going to take off, uncomfortable conversations with a black man. You really just did it out of the goodness of your heart trying to help. And then next thing you know, boom, 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 boom. Here you are years later at 90 million views. I mean, let's just back up. How did this happen? Um, Okay, let's put everybody in the driver's seat for a moment. So our world is in the midst of uh, some of the greatest chaos it has been in in the last 20 years. George Floyd had been murdered. We didn't know what to do, but we all to some degree knew we should do something. Mm -hmm. And Sadie, I lived in Austin, Texas at the time. I was pacing in my two-story townhouse back and forth. Should I weep? Should I scream? Should I vent? I didn't know what to do, but I grew up in, 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 in white areas. And so I quickly drove over to my white friend's house. It is four of them, Sadie. It was two couples, their next door neighbors, And I walk into their house and I am righteously angry. Hmm. I would say righteously. I was for sure angry. I don't know (laughs) if it was righteous or not. We can talk about that later. So I'm righteously angry and I go into their house and we're sitting there talking. And I said this to them and Sadie, I I hope you love this conversation because it's very real. And I hope all your listeners lock in right now. So I say this to them. I said, why is it that there's still so much racial tension? And they looked at me and they said, Emmanuel, we don't, we don't really know. They said, what do you think the cure or the, the, the cure can be? And I said, I think white people need to familiarize themselves more with black spaces. My mm-hmm. white friends asked me, they said, well, how? And I said, well, I don't know. You, you can go to black church. I used to go to church with them all the time. I said, you can go to black church, Sadie. They responded this. And this is how I knew I needed to start in comfortable conversations with a black man. They said, we thought black church was your thing. I paused. I said, wait a second. I said, but I go to, with y'all to white church all the time. They said, mm-hmm. that's, that's not white church. That's just church. Oh, I wow. said, to y'all is just church. 
because y'all are white. But when I walk into an auditorium with 2,000 people and I realize there are only seven people, how do I know there are only seven black people? Because I counted and there are only seven. Right. Um, then it's it's white church to me. So we're sitting there talking. And I say, I say to them, I say, how many black people were at your wedding? And they looked and they said, well, you, your brother, one. they said three. I said, so as much as you all want to act as though you literally live and exercise in black spaces, When you think about the people that were so close to you all that you invited to your wedding, there were only roughly three black people out of maybe 250 or so. And so at that point in time, I said, even my most beloved white brothers and sisters aren't properly exposed and integrated to black spaces. So Sadie, I I created uncomfortable conversations with a black man. I answered the four questions. Why are black people rioting? Why can black people say the N-word, but white people can't? What is white privilege? And uh, what about black on black crime? 25 million views in five days. I get a call from a no caller ID number. I'm eating Cheerios, Austin, Texas, glass (laughs) dining room table. It's Saturday morning, 8.35 a.m. I pick it up. Hello? Acho, McConaughey speaking. I want to have a conversation. I like... McConaughey? Like like Matthew McConaughey? You know, your voice starts getting all high when you get nervous. I'm like, McConaughey? Um, and so McConaughey's like, yeah, let's have another, let's have a conversation. He had watched episode one of Uncomfortable Conversations. Matthew McConaughey and I, we sit down the next day um, to wow. do a conversation. That gets seen by, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 million people. After wow. that, I get another call, uh, no caller ID number. Hello? Hi, Emmanuel. Oprah Winfrey speaking. Oh, Oprah? my gosh. Like, Oprah, <laughs> Oprah? Voice starts getting high again. Um, Oprah asked me, she says, Emmanuel, <laughs> what is your intention? I live by wow. that question now, Sadie, by the way. That's good. What is your intention? I encourage every listener in everything you do, whether it's a conversation, um, whether it is a occupation, whatever it is, always ask yourself, what is your intention? I love Oprah that. asked me, what is is your intention. Sadie, I was like, my intention is to change the world. And I truly believe I can. I'm currently working on writing a book. She said, books. I love books. (laughs) Um, And so Oprah and I partnered. (laughs) Great answer, right? Oprah and I partnered on Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. That was number three on the bestsellers list. Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Boy. That was number one on the bestsellers list. And then we've just recently written, um, partnered on a logical, which is led me to you. Amazing. Well, I think this story is so incredible and it's so exciting. I mean, God's hand is clearly on this and I need to start answering my no caller IDs because I just assume they're prank calls. What (laughs) have I missed? You never know. (laughs) Only do it once. Only do it once. Ever since I started sharing that story, people no caller ID call me. I don't pick up anymore. Oh, dang. (laughs) Dang. That's hilarious. That's amazing. Okay. So let's get into this book. You, You just wrote a book, Illogical. Now, this is like one of those books where you read it and you're like, huh, like, what does that mean? Because, you know, we are always taught to live like logically. But when you say that, it's like, that's confusing in a sense. But then when you just share what you've just shared, it's like, well, that's a pretty like crazy thing that goes past all like logic. This is pretty like almost illogical to even answer a no caller ID when you're eating some Cheerios on a Saturday morning. But look at where it's led you to, right? And so tell me a little bit about this book, um, backstory. um, Why was this the book that you knew this is my next move? So illogical, saying yes to a life without limits. I believe that, Sadie, our greatest accomplishments in life, they come on the other side of our logic. And I think that societally, we're far too logical. What is logic? Logic is simply conventional wisdom. But Mm. the problem with conventional wisdom is that it does not allow for the supernatural greatness that lies within you. And it doesn't allow for the supernatural greatness that lies within us. Being illogical is believing it is so, even when it isn't so, so Mm. that it may be so. Wow. Right? Believing that it is so, even when it's not so, so that it may be so. And if you look at people throughout the course of history, let's start biblically. Um, Noah, he believed that it was going to rain, even though theologians and historians submit the earth had never seen rain. The earth Mm -hmm. had never seen rain, historians submit. Noah believed it was going to rain, even though the earth had never seen rain, and he built a boat. Illogical. Um, You think about, practically speaking, Steve Jobs. 
a cell phone could act as both a GPS and a camera and an MP3 player. That is hmm. illogical. So now wow. the question is, what illogical greatness lives within you? What illogical hmm. greatness lives within me? Because our greatest accomplishments in life, I promise they lie on the other side of our logic. I love that. That's so good. Such a great message and such a needed book. It helps people live beyond themselves. I love how there's a quote in your book and you talk about stepping illogically into our calling isn't just for ourselves, but it's for something much bigger. And kind of thinking even about like David and Goliath. When David fought Goliath, it was for a nation, right? And so talk yeah. to me a little bit about how living illogically is really living outside of just yourself. Y'all, there are so many seasons in my life where I can look back and see God using certain places and people to teach me and help me grow. And if you know me, you know I love Liberty University. It's definitely one of those. Though I could rave about so many things, my favorite thing about Liberty is that they are truly training champions for Christ and have actually been doing that now for 50 years. What a legacy, and their mission has never wavered. Liberty is truly a one of a kind because while you're learning educationally, you're also growing and learning so much spiritually. Liberty is celebrating its 50th anniversary all because one man had a vision to establish a university that would impact thousands of lives for Jesus Christ. Since that first year in 1971, Liberty has been a campus of answered prayers and miracles. What began with only 154 students has now become over 250,000 alumni serving around the globe and more than 125,000 studying on campus and online. Liberty University offers many scholarships and discounts to help you reach your goals at a price you can actually afford, all while learning from skilled professors and forming lifelong friendships with other students from around the world. At Liberty, you definitely feel like more than just a number. You can build lifelong friendships. My siblings certainly have who have went there in person. Plus, it's just so nice to know that you have the option to attend remotely like I did so that it could always fit into your schedule, even if it's a crazy season. I know if you ask my siblings, John Luke, Bella, and Will, they would tell you the exact same thing. In fact, many people choose to attend class remotely with more than 450 online degrees from the associate level to the doctoral level. And today, most classes are 100% online. So if you've been on the fence, take that first step today. Check it out because online classes begin every eight weeks. And if you're looking to attend in person, there are more than 300 undergraduate and graduate degrees to choose from. What a great experience and an incredible opportunity to meet new friends with a student body that represents 50 states and over 70 countries. So to start your future now, go to liberty.edu slash Sadie. And because you're a Boy That's Good listener, you'll actually get your application fee waived. So friends, don't wait. Go to liberty.edu slash Sadie and get your future started today. Sadie, you know, so I'm the son of a pastor. Um, my, my dad was a pastor under Dr. Tony Evans for uh, 21 years. And Tony oh, Evans, I think awesome. you know Priscilla Shire. I um, do, and I love them. So that yes. is so cool. Ah, this is awesome. <laughs> so then my dad goes to start his own church. So we've all heard the story of David and Goliath 10,000 times. I will not bore you with the minutia, but here is what I don't think people really focus in on on that story. Um, when you live in a logical life, not only do you change your life, but you change the lives of those around you. When you think about the story of David and Goliath, it talks about how Goliath ran near the Philistine, but the sentence that nobody pays enough attention to is this. And the Philistine drew near to meet him at the battle line. Hmm. Why is that sentence so powerful? Because when we are called to live illogically, people are going to try to stop us. We could say it's spiritual forces. It could be family. It could be friends. It could be loved ones that doubt us. But we have to draw near our fears at the battle line. Hmm. Uh, when I wanted to write uncomfortable conversations, true story, Sadie, my team that I confide in said, Emmanuel, the market is too saturated for a book like that. Wow. Literally, my team that I employ to give me sound advice told me the market's too saturated. But I had to realize my calling was my calling. It wasn't a conference call. I love that. Yep. And be because, Sadie, it was my calling, I had to move forward with my conviction. And in mm -hmm. writing Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, I have now allowed other people to have their own conversations within Stand. their own offices, within their own families. So when you are illogical like David and when you run towards that battle line, 
then the dam breaks for everybody else. And as we know about a literal dam, when a dam breaks, it cannot be rebuilt. Mm. So once the dam breaks, the flood of grace and the flood of, 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 of wisdom and the flood of mercy and the flood of reconciliation and the flood of yep. healing and the flood of love, it will overwhelm. But you Sad. have to break the dam by being illogical. It's good. Wow. So good. This whole message is so needed. And I love how you talk about how it's not a conference call. It's your call. And I think a lot of people don't step into their calling because they let it be a conference call. And there's a part of your book where you talk about putting your earmuffs on or putting your ear headphones on. Um, Tell me about that. And when do you know you need to put them on? You know, because I think sometimes it's like, oh, I need wisdom, right? Like we need to let people speak into our lives who are the right people. But when do you know this is not the person that's supposed be speaking into my life or, you know, they're starting to make me doubt whatever I'm actually called to do? Mm, That's so good. That's such a great question. Um, What I love most about my recent Christmas gift, the Apple AirPod Pros, Sadie, is that they got a noise canceling function and they got a transparency function. The noise canceling function, you hit a button, you hold it, right AirPod for a second, and you can't hear anything on the outside. But then when you tap it again, it allows a little bit of noise from the outside in. We have to navigate our life as though we constantly have in AirPod Pros, canceling out noise completely at times, but still allowing a little bit of positive wisdom and construction in at times. We have to discern what is the difference. But we also have to remember, you can't let everybody on your boat or your boat going to sink. That's right. Right. Yep. Like, yep. think about there's so many stories we just overlook. Like, again, the story of Noah. After Noah finally built the boat and God was like, hey, bro, I don't think God said bro, but he might. <laughs> he was like, he was like, hey, bro, um, in seven days, it's going to start raining. Noah only brought on a select few people. Yeah. At the point in which, Sadie, you start to see the, 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 the clouds foreign rain, everybody would have tried to run on his boat. But you can only let so many people on your boat or your boat's going to sink. In the same manner, you can only allow so much outside criticism because your family might think it's crazy to leave that small city you all grew up in. Your Mm -hmm. girlfriend might think it's crazy to get out of that relationship with this dude who wants to propose, but you know it's a toxic relationship. You might think it's crazy to sell your possessions and go live overseas, but God's called you to. You might think it's crazy to leave that nine to five job where you're oh so comfortable and pursue the passion in your heart Mm. to be a painter, a singer, an artist, or start that entrepreneurial job. But sometimes you just got to put those earmuffs on, block out the noise and move with your conviction. That's good. That's such good advice. I love how you talk about it might be crazy. And you have this quote in the book. It might be crazy. If you say the words, I might be crazy, it's the first checkpoint on your path to accomplishing greatness. So good and so true. Do you remember the moment for you that you were like, this is crazy, you know, (laughs) but I'm going to do it. Like, do you remember that moment? Man, I have two. The very first one. Um, I was playing in the National Football League. I played for the Philadelphia Eagles. And National Football League, it's the sport that literally owns one day a week, Sundays. We all just forgot church is a thing, and we go rush (laughs) home to watch our favorite team. Sadie, I was in the NFL, and I went to my coach's office. While in my coach's office, I was looking at uh, uh, his wall. And his wall, it had a depth chart on it. A depth chart, listeners, is... It is a ranking of where you fall on the team of importance. Hmm. It will have first position, meaning you are first important, second, third, etc. I peruse this depth chart and don't see my name anywhere. I check again. I don't see my name. Finally, I'm like, what the heck? Why don't I see my name? I start checking other positions. I don't find my name. Sadie, my eyes go to the very bottom of the depth chart and I see big block letters. Cut. And the NFL cut means you're getting fired. Wow. So I see my name, Sadie, under these big block letters that say cut. There were four names under those under that word cut. One of the names had already been fired earlier that day. So I knew this is about to be it. Hmm. I leave my coach's office, Sadie, true story. And I go to the bathroom inside a professional football facility where the owner who is worth roughly, I think, five billion dollars is located. And I go to the bathroom and I get on hands and knees. I lock the stall and I just start praying. And I was Hmm. like, God. I know you did not bring me here for this purpose. 
at that mm-hmm. point in time, while in the bathroom stall of an NFL team facility on the coaches and owners floor, I was like, yo, Acho, you might be crazy. And at that point in time, I realized I wasn't crazy. I was just dangerously illogical, praying my way through that situation, ending up on that team um, and living the life in which I I, I currently live. The second moment would have to be, Sadie, when I sat in that chair in that all white studio for the first ever episode of Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. Yeah. Um, In retrospect, it seems very normal. But if you can imagine, Sadie, sitting in a chair, hiring a wedding videographer because you don't have a social media team and you don't have a cameraman, um, calling your best friend who's an Olympic gold medalist at the 2016 Olympics, renting out a studio space and talking directly to a camera for nine minutes and 17 seconds. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's pretty crazy to think that that conversation would change your world and ultimately have an impact on the world. But those were my two I might be crazy moments, but ultimately I wasn't crazy at all, just dangerously illogical. There are so many exciting things happening over here at LO between the conference and some other projects, and I'm so excited about them, but y'all, we are nonstop. And so when I'm home, I just want to rest and enjoy being with Christian and Honey. With our busy schedules, not only do I not have a lot of energy, but I also want to feel good and know that I'm getting the nutrients my body needs. You see, I want something that I can trust has been designed to fuel my body and also taste good. It sounds like too much to ask, but I'm here to tell you that it's not because AG1 by Athletic Greens checks all the boxes. It can 75 vitamins, minerals, and other whole food ingredients in just one scoop. This includes a multivitamin, probiotic, and all your green superfoods. So in one drink, you can fill all your nutritional gaps, boost your energy, and focus. Yes, please, Lord, help us focus. Help your gut health and digestion and build a healthy immune system. Plus, getting the right combination of vitamins can help regulate your sleep patterns too, which I think we all need a little extra help with too. I know what you're thinking, but it really does taste good because with all that, you can think that could go a little cray cray, but it's actually good. And I've gotten Christian hooked too. And now his parents are loving it as well. I don't think he believed me at first about the taste, but it stands to test. So if you're looking to focus on your nutrition, give Athletic Greens a try. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you an immune supporting free one year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. If you just visit athleticgreens.com slash woe today, again, just simply visit athleticgreens.com slash woe to take control of your health and give AG1 a try. You won't regret this one. I love it. I love it so much. It, you know, I even love your answer to Oprah that I want to change the world. And I think that, like, that's crazy. But I say the same thing. It's like when people ask me what I'm trying to do, what I'm doing, it's like, I want to make the world a better place. And I believe I can. Like, I believe I'm doing it. I believe I can. And I think some people look at the world and they think, you know, I could never or what could I do? But that's the kind of thinking that will make you never, you know, and make you not do the crazy, amazing thing of changing the world. And so I think you do have to have a little bit of that craziness in your mind and that illogical spirit to say, you know what? No, like this is what I'm going to do. Okay, so Manuel, you've done so many great things. You've had huge accomplishments. You have books that are New York Times selling. You have, you know, Oprah calling you, Matthew McConaughey. You have incredible views. But you also have had, you know, moments that have felt like failure or moments that have felt like setback and hard moments, you know, that maybe we haven't seen, maybe we don't know about. And I'm not asking you to tell me about this. But what I am asking you to help the listeners with is how do you get past that? You know, I think a lot of times people see that cut and see their name and they think, well, I'm out. Like, life's over. I'm done. But how do you push past those moments of failure and make them into something great? I love the quote. If all you, if what you see is all you see, then you do not see all there is to be seen. It's good. It's if good. what you see is all you see, then you do not see all there is to be seen. Um, during my lowest moments, and I've had some low, low, low moments. Um, mm-hmm. In eight years playing football, I got hurt seven times. I wow. tore my quad. I broke my thumb. I tore a ligament in my knee, my MCL. I tore another ligament in my knee. I tore my groin. I had a oh sports my gosh. Hernia. Um, and if all I saw was those injuries, then I wouldn't see the destiny on my life. Yeah. So my encouragement, Sadie, is like whenever you 
fail. And I always say, I didn't fail. I fell. And if I get up, I win. It's good. Because the winning isn't getting up. So to my listeners, I would just to remind them that like, yo, you didn't fail. You just fell. And at some point in time, we've all fallen. Um, And as long as you get up, you will win. So for me, I just don't believe my eyes. And not in Mm. the figurative sense. Sadie, in the literal sense, like when I saw my name under fired, I just had to choose to not believe my eyes. Um, In life, when you get laid off, you have to choose not to believe your eyes when you look at your bank statement and you're like, oh, it looks like I'm broke. Um, You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes you got to choose not to believe your eyes relationally. Well, God, I don't know if I'm going to be able to have kids. I thought I was going to be married at 20 and I'm already 30. You have to choose not to believe your eyes because sometimes truly you're choosing not to believe the lies. Yeah. Um, and and it's that good. I think is the best way to move past it is like, just don't believe the lie. Don't believe that lie. It's good. It's that, that's what faith is. It's the, you know, confidence in the things we hope for and the assurance in the things unseen. It's like, you know what? I don't see it. It might seem impossible. It might look impossible. But God, thank God I serve the God of the impossible. And he's with me and he's for me. And sometimes that doesn't look like getting back on the team. But it looks like going a new direction. And I think that's such an important thing to realize too. Because I think so many people are like, Sometimes it goes to that point of like, oh, well, that's not my case. That's not my case. That's not my case. And sometimes it is the case, but that doesn't mean that's a bad thing. That just means God has something different or God has something new. And it's not less than just because it's different and new. So I love that. Uh, so much of your book is childlike faith. You know, it's, it's having that childlike faith and you embody that so well. So I want to talk about this quote. It's so good. You said, I went from going to detention for talking to receiving Emmy nominations for talking. It's just such a cool story because I feel like in some ways in my own life, I felt like that too. Some of the things I was the most insecure about growing up is what I'm doing now as my job. And I'm like, really, God? That's crazy. Even storytelling. I used to be insecure about it because people would say, you tell stories so dramatically. Now, I'm literally telling stories. And, you know, part of that drama, if you will, is keeping people engaged and interested. And I'm telling Bible stories accurate to what they are, but in such a way that people love to listen. So I I feel you on that. When you look back at your life and you think about how God originally created you and what you're doing now, does it blow your mind the intention that's weaved into your story from little, you know, Emmanuel to now doing all these things you're doing now? Can you see the thread of God's intention in that? In hindsight, you can always see the thread of God. In the moment, though, you are lost as can be. Um, And also, we got to shout out God real quick. It was Emmy nominations when I wrote the book, but they turned into Emmy wins. Um, So shout out. That's awesome. (laughs) That's um, awesome. God God came through and we won, so I never have to win another Emmy again. I'm done winning Emmys. Um, That's great. No, you can, Sadie, you can always see the thread of God, but... I'm reminded of, in my life, the story of Joseph. (laughs) Like, I literally have a chapter in a logical, keep on dreaming, ending up being a sub-chapter. Because, like, we got to remember, Joseph was literally punished by his brothers because of a dream. And for those that are listening that aren't super familiar, remember, Joseph, youngest, all these, uh, I believe, 11 older brothers, maybe 12 older brothers, I believe, the youngest of 12. And dude is sold into slavery because he told his brothers, hey, look, I had a dream and y'all all all gonna worship me. Now, for those listening, I don't really advise sharing dreams of people worshiping you, but nonetheless, Joseph did it. And um, he shares this dream, gets sold into slavery, but it was Joseph's ability to discern what dreams were that made him second in command of all of Egypt and ultimately allowed him to bless his same brothers, when there was poverty and famine in the land. So the same thing that people will punish you for will be the exact same thing that God will use you and esteem you for, but ultimately allow you to bless other people. So Sadie, like you told in your life and in my life, I used to get sent to detention for talking too much. 
And now my school has asked me to come back and talk and do the opening convocation. And now I speak for a living. It's, it's your story. It's my story. It's the story of Joseph, but it's the story of all of us. Here, I think, though, is a pivotal lesson, Sadie, I had to learn is you have to let God use you to bless people in the end. Because think about, like, if I was Joseph, truth be told, and my brothers threw me in a ditch and sold me to slavery, when they came around hungry for some food, oh, y'all just going to have to be hungry. <laughs> like, y'all yep. just, so y'all I thought just about gonna, that when you threw me in the pit. It. Yep. Y'all just, just going to have to be hungry. In the same breath, those who told me in comfortable conversations the market was too saturated, it's like, yes, you could go back and pour salt or vinegar into the wound, but instead it's like, no, just let God use you ultimately to bless those because what Satan and what other people meant uh, for your ill, God's always going to use for your good. Exactly. And okay, God's obviously put these gifts in each of our lives. You talk about it as the it factor. I love that. And I want to talk about that in a second. But it's like, what would be the best strategy of the enemy would be take away your it factor, you know, like, let that be the thing people come after that be the thing people are jealous of so much to the point that they hate you for it or make you insecure about it. Because if he can take away your it factor, then that's stopping you from being the fullest potential that God put inside of you. And so, yeah, I love, like, no coincidence that we look back and say, that is so funny. That was the thing I was the most insecure about, and now it's what I'm doing for a living, making the world a better place because of it. So I love that. Okay, so talk about people's it factor for a second. How do people discover what it is that they, you know, have been put on the planet to do? It's a big, it's a big thing. Well, let's go full circle. Um, at the very end of a logical which is a book where I encourage people to go be their best versions of themselves and change the world. I couch my entire books by saying this, Sadie, if all you've heard is that you can do anything, you have heard too much. <laughs> That's right. right. That's right. And it's very sobering, but I was reading a, a marriage book one time and it talked about how if you want to sustain a relationship, it's best that you get married after 25 you all are both financially stable and you do not have kids prior to your financial stability. It mm -hmm. talks about like if you want to sustain a relation, a marriage and not end in divorce. But it couches a whole book by saying, if all you've heard is that if you get married after 25 and you wait on having kids until you're financially stable and both of the, the partners are financially stable, then you will not get divorced. You've heard too much. That's right. Yeah. And um, so, so what is it? Let me tell you this in story form. June 9th, 2020, um, I get a call. I pick up. You have the thing, my friend. You have the thing. And coming from someone who had the thing and has the thing, you, my friend, you have the thing. It was Oprah. We had just finished doing a two-hour show together on Apple TV. The Oprah conversation meets uncomfortable conversations. She had called to tell me, Emmanuel, you have the thing. You have it. So I say, uh, what's the thing, Sadie? She's like, you have a unique ability to speak hard truths, but people still want to hear them. Awesome. I'm reminded that day of a truth that I have to remind everybody listening to this phenomenal conversation. You have the thing. You have the thing. Now the question is, how do you find your thing? Hmm. What are you uniquely, uh, what are you uniquely skilled at in this life? And hmm. what do you have a yearning and desire to do. Yeah. Is it sing? Is it write? Is it serve? Is it love on children? Is it be empathetic? Is it lead? Is it compose? Because everybody has the thing. They have a unique ability that they have that they are enhancedly good at. Or everybody has a passion, but everybody has the thing. The trick mm. though, Sadie, I've realized is. It's your developing of your thing in private that will yep. lead to the praise in public. Like snapping, that's that, so good. That's that's what people don't realize. We all yes. have the thing. I promise you listening, take a beat, pause if you're in your car. Don't pause because you might have a green light. But if you're <laughs> in your car and you drive and take a beat and just really wait a second, that was my thing. Yeah, uh, but now it's it's what you work on in private that's praised in public. Let's talk David real quick again. David and Goliath. The reason that David was able to slay Goliath wasn't because he got lucky. 
But y'all have to remember, and I encourage everybody, go back and look at that story. When Goliath, nine foot nine giant, was punking everybody and they mama, when everybody was scared (laughs) about Goliath, Goliath, David was like, man, when when lions and bears came after my sheep and the flock, he said, I would rescue my sheep from the mouth of bears and lions. So who is this giant to me? That's right. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Like... My dog David was like, yo, I've been working on my thing in private. So That's you all good. are going to make me king in public after I say this giant. But this giant is nothing to me because I've been saving sheep in private. In the same manner, Sadie, like everybody saw uncomfortable conversations, but I had been sharpening my tools conversationally in private. That's right. So what I did in private finally got praised in public in the same manner of how you live your life. So everybody listening is just understanding it's the tools that you sharpen in private that will ultimately lead to your esteem in public, but you just have to sharpen your tools. So the three takeaways, find your thing, develop your thing, and ultimately use your thing. Those are the three takeaways. Find your thing, develop your thing, use your thing. That's great. Boom. There it is. If you're ever preaching or speaking at a church, you let us know because me, Christian, and Honey will be on the front row shouting you down. It's so good. And it, I, I agree with everything you said. I think so many people think that their it, you know, um, is dependent on if it ever is successful, if it ever, uh, there's a stage attached to it, there's a platform, if they get, um, you know, social media famous, TikTok famous, this fam- whatever it is, but that's not it. Like, you're it. That you can do no matter where you are, no matter what season you're in, and you need to because that is, I think, how you know you begin to have the confident trust in God and the confident trust in yourself to know that when I do get the platform, if I do, or when it does become successful, then I'll know that I know that I know I'm ready for this moment because I've been I've been with the lions and the bears. So what is this giant? Mm, and I think preach. for me, I'm the same way. You know, I am preaching and speaking and doing these things and you know people are like I want to do what you're doing I'm like well then do it because I've been doing this since I was in seventh grade having girls over at my house teaching them the word of God I've been doing this my whole life like there's videos of me when I was five years old standing on my countertop telling my parents God loves you he has a plan for you all this stuff and I'm still doing the same thing you know and I think God's just cultivating that within you and so friend listening if you are thinking you know whenever I get out of college Whenever I do this, whenever I do that, then I'll do it, blah, blah, blah. Start now. Start now. Start cultivating what he's put in you right now. And you'll be amazed at the places and the spaces you walk into. And one day, you might be looking at a giant, and you'll be able to say, you know, I got this because this is what God's done in me. And so, Emmanuel, I can't thank you enough for being on this podcast. Man, those three takeaways were great to end on. And everything you've said has been an incredible encouragement. You said at the beginning, I live by quotes, and I I know what you mean now. I mean, quotes just (laughs) spill out of you, but it's in your heart. And so for everyone listening, I hope you're encouraged by this conversation. And it doesn't have to end here, learning from Emmanuel. He has so many resources out there. His new book, Illogical, is a great one for you to go read. That's what we talked about today. He also has um, other books like Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man and a Black Boy as well. He also has YouTube. He does all kinds of things. Go follow him on social media. You'll be able to figure it out. But thank you again. I'm glad we're official friends. Official friends. So thankful for this conversation. Sadie, you're the best. We'll talk soon.